My name is Max Ardika. I'm a principal engineer, part of the Insieme Business Unit, which is the same team of Andres that brings you Nexus 9K and ACI. And I've been working for the last couple of years of all the architecture to interconnect ACI networks, right? And so what we're going to talk about today, 20, 25 minutes, with a demo at the end, hopefully, is ACI multi-site. As Andres said in his introduction, is one of the most important, I would say, feature that ACI 3.0 uh, release brought when, uh, when it was released in August. Okay? So in order to understand what ACI multi-site is, and I don't know how many of you have heard about ACI multi-pod and multi-site before. Good. So <laughs> at the end of these 20, 25 minutes, I hope that at least you have an idea. If someone tells you, CI multi I want to build a CI multipod, what it is, versus a CI multi-site. And in order to get to the point, I'm going to give a quick overview of the journey that we did with ACI from the moment we released ACI in uh, release 1.0 to date. So in 1.0, ACI was a single fabric called also a single pod. So a typical fabric leaf and spine topology, right? Uh, supporting all the functionality that ACI brought uh, to us in terms of programmability, et cetera. Um, but this was basically deployed in a single data center because it was a single pod, a leaf, a full mesh leaf spine. Uh, the moment customer got their hands on ACI, they started thinking, well, would it be nice if I could extend the ACI connectivity across physical data center, so, so to be able to manage the different data center as a single logical entity. And this basically created what we call the, like the ACI stretch fabric. Okay, so what stretch fabric is, is essentially a ACI topology which is not the typical leaf spine topology of the single pod with, uh, with full mesh leaf spine, but it's more a partial mesh topology. Okay, there are some leaf, which we call transit leaf, that connect, as you see here, to the local spine and to the remote spine. Where customer deployed the stretch fabric was when they had data center like in a metro area, for example, where they didn't have enough bandwidth to create a full mesh of all the leaf to all the spine, and so they created this partial mesh. But functionally, the stretch fabric was still a single pod. So all the control plane protocol running in a CI, and I don't know if you know, we use ISIS in the underlay, we use MPBGP, we use COOP. So there is a set of protocols that allow ACI to work. They were running in this stretch fabric end-to-end -end across all the data center, right? So as such, the stretch fabric represented a single network full domain. And this raised some concern because customers were like, well, I interconnect my data center like this, I manage them with a single epic controller cluster, which is cool because it makes things simpler but I have a network full domain that extends across my data center, which I don't like. Because of that, we deployed one year ago, and this was released in ACI 2.0, the first architecture called ACI Multipod, which allows essentially to interconnect different pods using an external layer 3 network that we call the IPN, the Interpod Network. Now, the external IP network is just a pure layer 3 transport, because all the control plane and data plane required to establish pod-to-pod -pod communication is done at the pod level. So we use VXLAN data plane between pod. We use an EVPN control plane to exchange endpoint reachability information so that endpoints in pod one can talk to pod two, three, four. And all these pods are managed with a single epic controller cluster. So this gave the same benefit of the stretch fabric in terms of being able to, to manage different data centers with a single cluster, with a single epic, which is, makes simpler the solution. In fact, if, uh, if I had to define multipod with a word, it would be simple. But at the same time, at the network level, each pod was independent from the other pod. So the ACI control planes running in pod one were completely separated and different from the ACI control plane running in pod two, three, four. Okay, so we built different network fault domains, all managed with the same epic controller cluster. So that's a solution which is very, a very robust and uh, resilient way to interconnect ACI network. Why but didn't we stop there? Does that mean I'd have to define each policy in each pod? No, the policy, and that's the why ACI multipod is simple, the policy is defined only one, because you have one single controller cluster, right? Okay. You can spread the nodes of your cluster across pods for resiliency, but when you connect to each of them, you define a policy, that policy is available everywhere, right? So you have layer two, layer three connectivity and policy extension by definition across all the pods, which makes the solution simple. And I was saying, why didn't we stop there? 
we didn't stop there because one concern that people had with the ACI multipod was, yes, it's great, it's simple, it's simple to extend connectivity, it's simple to extend policy, but what if I make a mistake when I make a policy? When I change a policy for a tenant? That policy is gonna be pushed everywhere, right? So it's a single, ACI multipod represent, represent a single tenant change domain, okay? I make a mistake, that mistake is propagated everywhere. So we needed something more for specific use cases like disaster recovery because you don't want to have a disaster recovery deployment where with a mistake, configuration mistake, you affect your main site and your disaster recovery site. And that's where a CI multi-site comes into the picture. As I said, the CI multi-site is the latest architecture that we deployed, available from 3.0. It looks, and I'll talk a little bit more about multi-site, it looks similar if you look high level to multi-pod, but the Striking difference is multi-site interconnects different fabrics. It doesn't interconnect pods, interconnects fabrics, which means interconnects epic domains, okay? Each site, each fabric is an independent epic domain, which means now I have a possibility of applying a policy in one site, but not in another site. So I can define a policy and say this policy needs to be applied to site one, but not to site two. Or I can say I make a change to the policy and that change is applied to site one, but not to site two, okay? So I have still independent network fault domain, but now also independent tenant change domain. That's why we define each of the site of each of these fabric like an availability zone. It's a full availability zone because I have network fault domain isolation and tenant change domain isolation. However, we still want to allow to have a solution, an architecture which is easily manageable. Okay, and that's why we introduced in the solution a third component, which is the one small here in the middle that I will cover more, which is called the ACI Multi-Site Policy Manager. Okay, what the ACI Multi-Site Policy Manager is, is the single pane of glass where I go and define my policy. Your question was before, in multi-pod, when I define a policy, is it available everywhere? It's yes. We multi-site, we wanna give the same simplicity of defining policies, by giving you the control where this policy are actually pushed. And the single point of management where we define the policy is the SCI multi-site policy manager. I define the policy there, and then I decide where this policy, to which epic domain, this policy needs to be uh, rendered and deployed, okay? So I will talk a little bit more uh, about multi-site for the rest of the session, but this is the, the journey that we did, and this is the reason why we didn't stop a multi-pod. Now, what I expect will happen, uh, is that customer will, there will be customers that still deploy both of these architecture because they both cover different use cases in my opinion. Multipod is perfect for truly active active data center because it's a very easy way to extend connectivity and policy across data center. Multisite is more targeted for disaster recovery use cases or for scenarios where I want to have complete isolation at the network full domain and at the tenant change domain between my data center sites. Okay. And there is more to come, which I'm not gonna cover it here today, but we, you will see, uh, you probably have seen already the blog that uh, Tom Etzel posted about ACI Anywhere. The idea is that we are gonna keep extending the policy and the network connectivity, uh, network connectivity of the ACI to other parts of the network, right? This multi-pod and multi-site allows you to interconnect data center. We wanna be able to extend ACI also to the cloud. We want to extend it to other areas of the network where you may not have the need to, to build a complete uh, pod or fabric, right? And so you will, you will see at the end of this year and by the mid of ne next calendar year, more of this option popping up. Now, why did I say that multi-pod and multi-site will be deployed together? Because basically what is the main requirement that infrastructure team have is to basically provide infrastructure support for the application that need to run on top of this infrastructure. And in order to, to provide a resilient infrastructure support to the application, usually they wanna be able to define or to deploy independent availability zones, right? If you think about AWS, when you run an instance in AWS, you can actually run that instance across different availability zones for resiliency purpose. Here the idea is the same. I am the network administrator. I want to build my infrastructure in a way that my application team then can deploy application in the most resilient way. So I want to build independent availability zones, and I want to give my application team the capability of de de deploying 
applications across the availability zone. So, so that no matter what happens on one availability zone, my application will continue to work and function because it's also uh, developed or deployed in the other availability zone. Okay? So how does this matter or how does it map to multi-pod and multi-site architecture? Well, what we expect people will do, each availability zone, as I said, is defined as a epic domain, as an epic cluster, as a fabric. So when you have a requirement to do a truly active-active data center deployment, which represents a single availability zone, that's where you can deploy multi-pod. Right? Multi-pod represent a fabric. It's still a fabric because it's managed by a single epic domain. And so it represents an availability zone. I can then build a second multi-pod fabric. Could be a single pod, but could be also multi-pod. And then I deploy my application across this availability zone. And to allow connectivity required between this availability zone, that's where multi-site comes to the rescue, right? So now you have multi-pod to build active active data center, multi-site to interconnect these independent fabric with each other, okay? And the two architecture goes end in end, okay? So that's the vision, that's the idea, that's where we wanna take our customer and there are already several that are planning to go down this path, okay? Multi-pod, to be honest, I've been in Cisco for, since 1999. Uh, multi-pod has been one of the most successful architecture because it's simple. But I think with, multi, with the combination of multi-site, now we will be able to cover pretty much every possible use case uh, that requires interconnectivity of a CI fabric. So can we yeah. connect the previous presentation talking about Kubernetes and ACI yeah. and uh, the endpoint groups and this concept? Mm -hmm. How do we, when we're talking about a holistic data center and multi-data center, architecture, how does one play with the other? So I can do multi-data center in Kubernetes. You could do, so for example, you could do a Kubernetes integration with multi-pod. Multi-pod represents a single epic domain, so you will integrate uh, Kubernetes the same way Andres explained before, without knowing that actually you have multiple pods interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. Functionally, it's one, it's right. one fabric. If you then you need to provide a more resilient uh, connectivity or deployment of Kubernetes, you can actually deploy different Kubernetes domains across the different fabrics because you peer your Kubernetes with Epic 1 in one fabric and with Epic 2 on the other fabric, and then you can establish connectivity between this container, right, but more using multi-site in a more resilient fashion. So multi-site is, for multi-site, Kubernetes is just one of many applications it's that one of many, Exactly. It's one of many of these VMN domain, like with vCenter, right? And I'll show you during the demo, we can create a VMN domain, a vCenter domain if you want in Fabric 1, a vCenter domain in Fabric 2, but still allow this virtual machine to communicate using multi-site across, right? And that's, again, is the beauty of having this uh, uh, coherent architecture end-to-end. Uh, -end. They extend connectivity and policy end-to-end. Uh, -end. Um, so, Few more minutes on multi-site. So as I said, the, the functional component of multi-site are essentially three. There is the network, because traffic needs to run on a network. It doesn't run on thin air, right? And that's the fabric with the switches, the leaf and the spines, okay? There is the epic, and actually multiple epics, because as I said, each fabric is its own epic domain. And there is this third component, which is the multi-site policy manager, that allows essentially to define the policies, the configuration, if you want, that then can be deployed in the different data center. Right? I can decide that deploy, I want to deploy this application A. I define that application A with its own endpoint group, with its own rules, security rules between the endpoint group on the multi-site policy manager. And then I push the deployment of that application to the site where I want to push it. If I want to deploy it only on site one, I push it only to site one. If I want to deploy it to three sites, I push it to three sites. So I have a fine level of control where and when I deploy my application or where and when I change the security rules that dictate the communication of the different application components, okay? which is something that multipod cannot give me. And from a communication perspective, why multi-site remains simple uh, is because from a connectivity perspective, I can establish layer two or layer three connectivity between my sites seamlessly without worrying about what's, what, what, what's happening in the IP network that interconnects the site. 
if you compare this with traditional DCI solution, in traditional DCI solution, if you need to extend the VLAN between data centers, you need to map that VLAN to a DCI technology that could be OTV, VPLS, and then on the other side, map the you know, VPLS circuit or OTV to a VLAN, and that's how you extend connectivity. Here, it's all done end-to-end -end using VXLAN across, across sites. Okay? So that's, the idea, again, is put more intelligence on the fabric and let the network in the middle just provide interconnection, interconnectivity, okay? Um, so what is this multi-site policy manager? Multi-site policy manager, as I said, is the third component that comes with the solution, is the place where we're gonna define the policies. So normally on Epic, we have two functionality. We define the policy, and then we render the policy, which means we push the policy to the switches. The multi-site policy manager implements the first part, the policy definition. The rendering of the policy is still done at the EPIC level in each site, but the policy definition is now centralized on the multi-site policy manager. So the multi-site policy manager is a manager of manager of multiple EPICs? It's a sort of manager of manager, but it's not that it really manages the EPICs. What it does, it defines the policy. And pushes That down. then are pushed to the EPIC to be rendered local in the site. Correct. Right? And, and we didn't want to create another epic, so the functionality that the multi-site policy manager reduced respect to the, I know, I, all the knobs, right? You, you kept it simple. You didn't do more than you had to, which exactly. is good. Exactly. And I'll show you, actually, and, and this is an internal uh, detail, but also from a deployment perspective, the multi-site policy manager was defined, was deployed by a different team in Cisco, not by the epic team, right? So we had three teams, the switching team, the epic team, and the multi-site policy manager team collaborating to build this architecture. Okay? And it's actually the team that deployed the, the clicker, uh, the Cisco Cloud Connect. That's the same team that deployed the multi-site policy manager. If you are familiar with the Cisco Cloud Connect, you will see some similarity with the GUI. So what it is, I, very quickly, it's a cluster of three virtual machines. Okay? At FCS, so in the first release 3.0, the CI poly, we basically de uh, delivered an OVA that can be basically used to create a virtual machine. And actually, you deploy three OVA, three virtual machines, you create a cluster, and they represent your uh, policy manager, your ACI multi-site policy manager. Obviously, each OVA can be run initially on an ESXi hypervisor, and we picked that format because the VMware vSphere is still the more, most common hypervisor out there. We have plans to you know, uh, provide more form factor, even a physical form factor for, the, for each component, for each node of this uh, policy manager cluster. For the okay. people with more rack space than they know what to do with. Say again, sorry? For the physical form factor for people who have more rack space than more they know what to do with. More rack space, it's more an operational uh, separation, right? You want the infrastructure team to manage this as a, you know, as a physical device instead of relying maybe on, a, on the server team to provide the hypervisor support, right? That's, that's the main reason why we have requests from customers to have a physical. Yeah, because I want to play with my toys and I don't want to play with his toys. Correct, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and that's, that's the reality. Silos still exist, right? It's well, the, uh, hey, layer eight of the OSI model is clearly oh, politics. Okay. Very powerful and important. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the important thing is that connectivity between the multi-site policy manager and each epic is done on the outward band uh, network. So there is no a requirement to connect these VMs of the policy manager to the fabric. Actually, most likely they will be connected somewhere else in the, ne somewhere else in the network where I can have just connectivity to the outward band uh, addresses of each epic domain. And what the policy manager allows to do, as I said, most importantly, allows you to define the policy that then can be pushed to the different epic domains, but it also allows you to create the day zero configuration to interconnect the different fabrics, right? I need to have a control plane to exchange reachability information between the fabric. I don't want to have to set that up at the single epic domain level. I want to do also that configuration from a single point of management, right? Okay, do I, does that say I can have a second of latency Round you trip? can have up to a second of latency between the multi-site policy manager. I'm a storage guy. It's been decades since I've seen SEC without S yes. something so the idea, modifying it. Exactly. The idea, essentially, there is no latency restriction, right? The yeah. idea of multi-site is that you can really interconnect and manage data centers that are deployed across the globe, right? Oh, yeah, one second is enough for you can satellite go. link <laughs> exactly. globally. Exactly. And the so only when, when we have a data center on Mars, you'll have a problem. We, 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 will have a solution that for that. Well. Yeah. we will manage that as well. But that's an important thing because multi-pod instead, for example, you still have a restriction up to 50 milliseconds between the different pods because it's a single epic 
right. domain stretch across. Okay, so here we wanted to give you the capability of managing data centers. That's worldwide. Yeah. So this is very high level overview. Now I'm going to show you a quick demo how this multi site policy manager looks like. Okay, as, a, as I said, uh, it was deployed by the same team. Does it look? Hmm, the resolution is not that great, but okay. So this is the CI multi site policy manager. Let me explain you what I'm going to show you is essentially a, uh, an application, a very simple application. I have, I don't know if it's, well, I don't think it's possible to make, let me make it smaller maybe. Okay. In this example, I have, let me do 50%. I have a, a, a web client, the application is very simple. I have a web client which basically connects to a database, retrieves a path, and then gets images from an NFS filer. Okay, and the key point is that these three components, these three virtual machines of the application are deployed across different sites. And I will show you that, okay? And if the application works, you basically see that we get images, the Tesla images. In fact, that's the application is called Tesla because basically we stream these images from that NFS server, okay? I will show you that if I change the contract between these components of the application, this basically will stop getting images, right? Just to, to give you the point that these different VMs can communicate across these different fabrics. So as a first thing, I connect to my, this is the GUI of the multi-site policy manager. Obviously the multi-site policy manager has a GUI, but also offers REST API so that you can interconnect with the uh, uh, upstream northbound orchestrator. Um, I connect to the multi-site. So when you get to the multi-site policy manager, you have a dashboard, right? And on the dashboard, you can see the different sites that are interconnected. So as a minimum, even if you want to use it just for a, as a dashboard, it gives you an overview of the sites that are connected. And from each epic domain, from each site, I get information about the faults that I locally have. So if there is a big problem in one of the sites, I will have you know, a, single point of, a single pane of glass where I can see immediately that I have a problem there. Uh, and if I have a problem, then here I have my list of sites, and this is the uh, view where I can add a site if I want to manage another site, right? And when I push add a site, allows me to essentially specify what is the IP address and the credential for the new epic domain that I want to import in my GUI. Um, and I can also, as you see from the site view, I can also do configure infra, which, as I was saying, allows you essentially to configure all the BGP VPN, all the parameters required to interconnect the control plane between the different sites. Okay? Um, from each site, I can also, as an action, I can open an Epic user interface, so I can actually directly connect. I go to the Epic uh, domain, and I can connect to the GUI of the Epic in that specific site to, to check things at the, at the Epic level if I want. So the demo is very simple, and since I'm a little bit out of time, I'm going to uh, speed it up and go there. We have, in the uh, multi-site policy manager, we have the concept of tenant, like you have the con concept of tenant, multi-tenancy in SCI. So in my, I have my Tesla tenant which as you can see here has been assigned to two sites. So I mapped that tenant, I deployed that tenant in both sites, and I have the concept of schema, which is then where I define inside the schema, I define a template which defines my policy, okay? And here, as you see inside the template, I have terms that are common if you know ACI, so EPG, we already covered endpoint groups, so I have different endpoint groups, each endpoint groups is where my virtual machine are connected. I have contracts between the EPG that basically dictates what type of communication I allow between this, this different EPG. All of these, EPG, bridge domain, VRF, contracts, define in this single point of management. So as I told you before, in this demo, I am actually streaming uh, images on the web client from the, the, the NFS filer, right? So I'm gonna make this a little bit uh, bigger, um, if I'm able to, so I'm a little bit, okay, so let me move this out of the way here, and now what I'm going to show you is that if you look here, you see my web Tesla is basically consuming a contract which allows, allows the, the web virtual machine to connect to the NFS filer. I'm going to go and change this contract real quick, I'm going to remove the contract that is consumed by the web Tesla. I say deploy to sites, so 
it tells me that it's going to go and push to the two sides, San Francisco and New York, this change, so this deletion of the contract. And the moment I do that, my images are not there anymore, right? Because I changed the rule that says the web VM could actually access the NFS filer to get these images. Yep. So the application is broken. I can go back. I can go back here and basically reapply my contract. There's the security consumed. And the moment I do that, I do save and I do deploy to sites. It tells me that it's going to make these changes, adding back the contract to the sites. I do deploy. And my virtual machine now start streaming again the images. Right? So that's a, a simple example of how I can actually imp, uh, influence the connectivity and the policy that I apply between virtual machine deployed in different sites from this single point of management. Okay? So there is more information that you will find. There is a Cisco Live session about multi-site. There is a white paper that is coming out in a week or so on Cisco.com. If you have any specific questions, since we are out of time, you can find me at the end, uh, uh, at the bottom of the room. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.